I recently read an article by Roger Jones from the Harvard Business Review entitled, The Family Dynamics We Grew Up With Shape How We Work. And it started like this. It said, does your CEO remind you of your bullying older brother? Or the mother who always refolded your clothes because you didn't do a good enough job? Or the emotionally distant father who never praised you? Well, watch out. Chances are your CEO is recreating the very same dynamics that shaped their early family life. He went on to say that research has shown that our early family experiences often reemerge in our adult life interactions with others. And so he asks the question, what should you do if you suspect that early childhood issues are affecting your behavior, or if you've been told that you have a problem dealing with people? He said, number one, make sense of the early family events that shaped you. Ask yourself, did family members speak openly or did they rarely discuss their mind? Were emotions openly shared or rarely disclosed? How did your primary caregivers respond to pressure? Did you have any significant life events? Maybe the death of a caregiver or the birth of a disabled sibling. Number two, self-diagnose how you behave with your team or those around you today. Ask yourself or ask a friend you trust whether you might be playing out any of these family attributes as you lead your team. Think about which of these behaviors serves you well and which should be discarded and replaced with more effective behaviors. And number three, make changes happen. Think about your new behaviors that you need to adopt with your team, but don't deeply intellectualize them. Instead, just start to do them. You might be surprised that this simple approach of living the new behavior will help you rewrite your own inner script and make you feel more at ease with new ways of thinking and interacting. Well, I thought that was interesting, but more interesting to me, I think, is how important and lingering these family interactions and dynamics really are. I mean, if you stop to think about it, the way that we interacted um, with our family as kids influences a lot of how we face the world and interact with each other today. Uh, if, you're, if your parents were warm and attentive and encouraging, you're probably predisposed to those traits yourselves. But if your parents were cold and distant and critical, well, like it or not, you probably recognize some of those tendencies in yourself as well. You know, the Bible is full of things to say about families too. In fact, God has such a beautiful and strange view of family that He, in His great wisdom, decided even to adopt us, those who truly follow Jesus, into His own family. I mean, can you believe it? You and me and Tom Hanks, Mother Teresa, and Justin Bieber, all in one big happy family. Like I said, it's strange, but beautiful. It's like in 1 John 3 verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. It's true. We're family, and there ain't nothing we can do about it. But almost as important as being in the family is how we interact with each other. Because as we've already seen, how we interact with, with one another in our families impacts not only us, not only future generations of our family, it also affects how we interact with those around us who are outside of the family, and even how we interact with God himself. Let me explain. There's a great quote from the German theologian and pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book Life Together, where he explains two services that we owe our family in Jesus. We'll take a look at the first one today. Listen carefully. The first service one owes to others in the community involves listening to them. Just as our love for God begins with listening to God's word, the beginning of love for other Christians is learning to listen to them. We do God's work for our brothers and sisters when we learn to listen to them. Listening to others is God's work. You want to work for God? You need to listen to those around you. And I don't just mean that you should stop for air when you're talking with a friend. Listening to those around you means that when the other person's talking, instead of formulating your next point, or you simply stop and you hear their story. You listen to where they're coming from. You listen to their heart and you strive to understand their point of view. But it doesn't stop there. True listening is far bigger uh, than even that. Try listening to the cultures around you, the, sub, the subgroups, and not just the ones that you agree with. You know, I think one of the biggest detriments of the social media age is that if you don't like someone else's point of view, you can just delete them. But that's not the way of Scripture. That's not the way of Jesus. Do you think Jesus approved of the way the tax collectors cheated the common folk? Or of the lifestyle of the prostitutes? 
Hardly. Uh, it probably broke his heart. But the scripture is, is very clear. He regularly broke bread with them anyway. He spent so much time with people on the other side that the ones that were technically on his side, they couldn't handle it and they plotted to kill him. And, and do you think Jesus was just spending his entire time with those dirty old sinners just preaching and proof texting to show them the error of their ways? I doubt it. Jesus wasn't dumb. He knew how to make a friend. And the way he make a friend is not by constantly criticizing their life choices and the circles they run in. It's not by pretending they don't exist either, but it's by loving them regardless. It's by spending quality time together, listening to each other's hearts and enjoying each other for who they are. And that's what Jesus did. In fact, the only harsh words that Jesus ever seemed to have were for the religious leaders of the day, the, the Christians who just couldn't seem to listen. Let's make this practical though. How do you practice true listening? You know, if you're the type of person who, who needs an action plan, then here's one for you. Number one, figure out something subcultural these days that, that just really bothers you. You know, vaccines, gender and sexuality, political persuasions, whatever it is, find something cultural that just, that just gets you and identify it. Number two, find somebody from the other side. Now, they're not too hard to find. If you're on social media, it's almost impossible not to come across someone with strongly rooted opposing views. And if you're not on social media, then use those life skills you've acquired with experience and find somebody. You gotta be deliberate. Number three, once you've found your person, ask if they would mind getting together for coffee and chat or tea and talking or, or muffins and monologues and tell them that you're interested in their perspective and you'd like to know some more about it. Tell them you promise just to listen and to learn. It's important that you do this because if you just go up to someone and, and ambush them with a question like that, uh, there's a good chance you'll catch them off guard and they may feel defensive and flustered. And maybe your home isn't the best spot for your conversation either. Maybe find somewhere neutral, a uh, park, uh, Tim's, the sushi place. And number four, and this may be the most important one of all, once you've agreed to a time and place, just make it happen, but leave your guns at home. Make a commitment simply to listen without ever firing a single bullet in return. I mean, you know yourself pretty well. So you make a solemn vow to God if you have to. Listen attentively, show genuine interest, and ask questions. Not the leading kind, but genuine questions designed only for you to learn more. None of this, ah, but don't you think that living this way is ruining your life and turning you into a horrible monster? I mean, that's, that's not listening, that's conniving. Uh, and number five, once your conversation is over, Thank them. Plan to get together again and then go home in peace. And congratulations. You have gained perspective on someone else's life story and why they do the things that they do. And hopefully, you've begun to, to see them and understand them as a person. And through this understanding, you've begun to love them. And this isn't all one-sided either. They've come away with a friend who's genuinely interested in who they are. They've been heard out without judgment, and most important of all, by treating them as a valuable person with interesting and valid ideas, they have met Jesus through their time with you. It's beautiful. You know, there's a passage in the book of James, chapter 3, where he talks about the tongue. He compares it with a rudder on a ship, small, but majorly affecting the entire vessel. He also compares it with, with a fire, saying, It's a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. And it's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Wow, what had he encountered that made him come up with that kind of imagery? Uh, it, but in chapter 1, verse 19, James also writes, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now there's a truth for our time. If only we as Christians were to be less reactive and more full of wisdom and grace. Bonhoeffer agreed. He continues, Many people seek a sympathetic ear and do not find it among Christians because these Christians are talking even when they should be listening. What a tragedy. You know, I wonder how many chances we've missed to comfort, to connect, to speak hope and love and forgiveness into somebody's life all because we were too busy talking to listen. I mean, surely you've been there when you've just needed to, to share your heart with somebody, but every time you begin, they just go off talking about themselves. But why do we keep on talking so much? 
Is it a nervous response? Are we afraid to get deep and, and intimate? Is it just that no one ever listens to us? You know, I think a lot of us don't feel heard. It's like we want to be validated as human beings. We crave for somebody to hear us out and tell us we're important. We're desperate to be listened to. And that's right back where we started because the key to talking less is listening more. And wouldn't it be just incredible if instead of being known as the people who condemn things, instead we Christians were known as the people who really listen? To paraphrase Gandhi, if we Christians were actually like our Christ, because to be perfectly honest, if Jesus were among us today, I think a lot of us might have a problem with him. He was too kind. He was too graceful to too many people. He wasn't racist at all. He treated women equally and let them be heard. In fact, Jesus had far more time for demoniacs, people completely buried and lost in their sin, than he did for the best and the brightest of the religious people who were completely blind to their own need for mercy. Those who were too busy talking to actually listen. If Jesus were actually here, I don't think he'd sit right with many of us. What would we do with his message to lay down our own rights, pick up our crosses and follow him? We'd just laugh him off, call him a sheep. Or as Isaiah 53, 7 says, a lamb led to the slaughter. If only we could stop and learn to listen. You know, James has it exactly right. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And, and that's the thing. See, as long as we stay in the habit of talking, Instead of listening, we're going to be annoyed with, frustrated by, and even dismissive of God himself. Or as Bonhoeffer put it, Christians who can no longer listen to one another will soon no longer be listening to God either. They will always be talking, even in the presence of God. Job 13, 17 puts it this way, Listen carefully to my words. Let my declaration be in your ears. There it is, listen carefully. Uh, the psalmist in chapter 81 says, But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, heavy. You know, of the many good reasons that we can come up with of, of listening first, this is probably number one. If we don't listen to others, if we don't listen to the cries of the world around us, it will be nearly impossible for us to actually listen to God. We'll only try to rule for him. And we've seen that story before, too. Isaiah 14, speaking of Lucifer, says, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I'll raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the top of the clouds. I'll make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. O oh God, in your mercy, let that not be us. See, there is a way out. There's a pathway to hope, even in this mess that we've so comfortably gotten ourselves into. And it's this. Confess our sins, for he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And pray, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And finally, my dear brothers and sisters, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Jesus, may we have the grace to listen to you and to learn from you, that we may have the grace to listen to and to learn from others. Amen.